One of my earliest memories is a profound experience of wonder. It happened in the spring that I turned five years old. I grew up in Vancouver, British Columbia, and on this particular day, my mother decided to take me to the frog pond, a place in the woods just a few blocks from our home. I still remember it vividly, walking through the forest on this loamy trail, and it was a spring day in British Columbia, so water is dripping from the trees. We arrived at the pond, and my mother wanted to take me there because she had heard there were tadpoles in the pond, and I was excited about this. So I walked up to the pond, and I looked down, but I didn't see anything. And I looked back at her, and she said, well, get closer. And I was wearing those nice big rubber boots of the time, and I stepped closer, still didn't see anything. And then I stepped into the water, and I could see these little things move away. And I realized there were thousands of tadpoles in the water. And I bent down, and I picked up a handful of them. And they were squirming in my hands, and I dropped them. And I took another step into the water, and my boot flooded. My first thought was, oh no, there's tadpoles swimming in my boot. I looked back at my mom and she just smiled and I went, okay, and I took another step. The next boot flooded. I took another step and another and another until the water was almost up to my chest. Now, I promise you, this is not something that most mothers would condone today, but it was a life-changing experience for me. In that pond, surrounded by thousands of tadpoles, I had this experience of oneness with the pond, like there was no difference between the pond and I, and that experience has stuck with me my whole life. Now, this is me at the age of five. We would go on these camping trips every single year with my family, and I love these trips up into the Rockies, and this was not where I fell in love with nature. That happened close to home, looking for rocks in the backyard, playing kick the can in the neighborhood, bushwhacking in that local forest. Like many kids of the time, most of us, I had a free-range childhood. I still remember my mother kicking me outside on a Saturday and telling me to come back in when the street lights came on. And I'm Pretty sure I remember hearing the door lock behind me as I walked away. <laughs> well, needless to say, that does not happen today. Over the past generation, there has been an indoor migration, with the end result that most kids today are living under effective house arrest, not able to go outside, whether on their own or with other kids. Today, the average North American child spends on the order of seven to 10 hours a day looking at screens. Seven to 10 hours. That same average North American child spends on the order of seven minutes a day playing outdoors. That is 90% less time outdoors than their parents and grandparents had. One author, Robert Pyle, refers to this as the extinction of experience. Now, hold on, you might be saying, or thinking to yourself, what's the big deal? You know, so kids are spending less time outdoors playing and more time indoors playing. What's, what's the difference? Well, maybe all the difference in the world. This generation of kids growing up today is experiencing all kinds of negative physical conditions, skyrocketing rates of obesity, attention deficit disorder, type 2 diabetes, depression, even myopia. And these conditions are moving earlier and earlier into childhood to the point where one U.S. Surgeon General recently said that this generation of children could be the first to have a life expectancy shorter than that of their parents. Now add to that the growing mountain of studies demonstrating the potential health benefits of nature. Physical benefits, mental benefits, emotional benefits. Just by being out in nature, you can relieve symptoms of depression, anxiety, and attention deficits. Just by being out in nature, you can decrease bullying. You can fight obesity and you can boost academic scores. Now, in addition to kids being at risk, the places we live and the wildlands we cherish are also at risk. 
Because decisions to conserve places like this are made in every generation. And let's be realistic. If people don't spend any time outside, why are they going to care about these places, let alone live sustainably and take care of them? In short, the disconnect between kids and nature is one of the most pressing and overlooked crises of our time. That's the bad news. The good news is we got into this mess within a generation, and we can get out of it even faster. I'm going to give you three simple tools that you can start using today, free of charge, to help the children in your life fall in love with nature. Together, those three things spell an acronym, NEW, N-E-W, with the idea being that we want to give kids new eyes, indeed new senses, to experience the world. The first of these tools, the N in NEW, is notice. Too often these days, we walk right past amazing natural events. It could be a butterfly on a branch, a hawk hunting silently overhead. It could be a beautiful evening sky. Whatever the clouds are doing at any given moment, you can rest assured that they will never be exactly the same ever again. It turns out that just taking a kid for a walk around the block, assuming your neighborhood is safe enough, can be a powerful experience, especially if there are stars. Now, because indoor lives, and especially looking at screens, tend to shut down our senses, when we head outside, one of the most important things if we're going to notice nature is to open up our senses. So I would like to suggest a habit to you that you get into that would be potentially one of the simplest habits you could develop. When you step outside the door in the morning, pause for 10 seconds. I promise you, you can afford the 10 seconds. And just open up your senses. What does the air feel like? How many different kinds of birds can you hear? What are those clouds doing? And do this with kids, because here's the deal. Kids value what we value, and if you don't value the natural world and show that you care about it, it's highly unlikely that kids will. The second tool, the E in new, is engage. And by this, I mean full body engagement. For a young child, this can be as simple as a stick and a puddle. As kids move into middle childhood, it's great to find activities that allow them to demonstrate increasing competence Things like fishing, or skiing, or hiking. Too often these days, when it comes to engaging in nature, we hear the word no from parents. No, don't throw that rock. No, put down that stick. No, get out of that tree. By preventing kids from engaging in risky play, we are also preventing them from learning how to navigate risk, a skill they will desperately need as teenagers and in the rest of their lives. The bigger risk is not letting them engage in this kind of play. So instead of being a helicopter parent, think instead about being a hummingbird parent. Sit on the periphery, zoom in only when necessary, which isn't very often, and zoom back out again. And as kids get older, increase the distance between you and them to give them greater independence. The third tool, the W in new, is wonder. If children are going to fall in love with nature, they need to feel that same sense of amazement that I felt as a child in that frog pond. There's lots of ways to do it. You can just take kids to amazing places. You can give them amazing experiences, harvesting, like harvesting and eating plants that they themselves planted and, and nurtured. You can give kids amazing ideas. One of the most powerful ways is through stories. Most of you spent time out in nature as kids Tell the stories of your own experiences in nature to get them excited and inspired about having similar kinds of experiences. Get them to tell their stories of experiences in nature to help bring those adventures to life. 
and ask questions. Parents are nervous often about taking kids out into nature because they know that those kids are going to ask questions and they're afraid they're not going to know the answers. But here's the secret. You do not need to know any answers. Questions are far more powerful. When my daughter Jade was seven years old, we went out on an adventure. Never go on a hike with kids. It doesn't end well. Go on an adventure, all right? Same thing, different name, works very well. So I was out on an adventure with Jade, and we were just a few minutes in, and we saw one of my favorite birds, a great blue heron. And Jade saw it, and she turned to me, and she said, Daddy, what's that bird? And it took every ounce of my biologist training not to give her, you know, not only the common name of the bird, but the scientific name and its diet and the habitat that it lives in. But on this particular day, I showed a little restraint and I said, I don't know, what do you think it is? And she said, I think it's a heron. And I said, well, what do you think it's doing? And she said, I think it's hunting. And I said, well, what do you think it's hunting for? And she looks up at me and she said, rodents. I went, wow, well, that's pretty cool. Let's sit down and see what happens. So we sat down in a rock and we watched this heron, and it was almost as if it was on cue. Within two minutes, this amazing large bird did that slow motion, zen-like bow until it got close to the ground, and then it drove its beak into the ground and came up with a mole in its beak. And it turned its head up, and we watched that mole go down the throat, into the body, and Jade was, whoa, this is amazing. And we stayed there for another 15 minutes watching this bird deplete the field of rodents. And as we continued on our adventure, Jade could not stop talking about it. As soon as we got home, she pulled out the bird book and she came running up to me and she said, Daddy, look, that was a great blue heron. Now, and she still remembers it to this day and she's 16 years old, let's rewind the tape. What if when she had said, Daddy, what's that bird? I'd said, hey, that's a great blue heron. And we kept right on walking. Missed opportunity. Questions are powerful. So there you have it. Three simple tools. Notice, engage, and wonder. Doesn't matter what order you use them. You can start with wonder, wondrous ideas or just get kids outside engaging in nature. Get them off the trail. Or just start noticing. The key is that all three tools are important to help foster that deep connection. And it turns out, when we get right down to the base of it, there are two key ingredients to helping kids fall in love with nature. The first of these is abundant time spent in wild or semi-wild places. Remember, for especially for young kids, that can be a backyard. The second key ingredient is at least one grown-up to share in the experience. So how about it? For the kids in your life, take the time to be a nature mentor. The best way to get kids outside is to take them there. So do that, and it will be an important thing for them. Now, you might be thinking, okay, but what if there's no nature nearby? And that is true. I mean, more of us live in cities today than ever before, and particularly in underserved communities, there's often not a lot of nature around. Well, the answer to this is also actually quite simple. What we need is a rewilding revolution. And I am not talking here about grizzlies and wolves coming back to the city. I am talking about something as simple as native plants. You see, native plants, plants that evolve to live in a particular place, are almost magical in their qualities. They, they are meant to thrive in that soil with those nutrients, under those environmental conditions, with the animals that, that are there. So simply by planting native plants, you can bring nature back. One of the thir first things to come back will be the insects. Because those insects also evolved over thousands of years, the native insects, to live in, to eat, and to pollinate those plants. Now, before you start worrying about hordes of locusts descending on your neighborhood, also recall that those native insects will attract native birds and other animals. Lots of things will tend to come back. So simply by planting native plants, we can rewild these places, which is absolutely amazing. 
You, we, want, we need to do this in backyards, in schoolyards, in courtyards, in churchyards, in city parks, and on apartment balconies. And this rewilding revolution could be transformative. Now, I'm a dinosaur paleontologist by training, which is a little odd. Uh, and I love to tell kids that all birds are dinosaurs, because they are. Dinosaurs are not extinct. There are over 10,000 birds alive today, and they're all dinosaurs. Eagles, chickens, pheasants, hummingbirds, every single one is descended from a little feathered raptor dinosaur closely related to Velociraptor. So when you look at scenes like this, you can imagine it as a miniature version of T-Rex versus Triceratops. Now that's amazing. Today I am not arguing that we have a back to nature movement where we abandon technology. I am not saying that we need to take our smartphones and toss them off the nearest bridge, although I admit I am tempted to do that on a weekly basis. Rather, technology in moderation can greatly enhance nature connection. You've probably heard of geocaching, this basically treasure hunt where you use geolocation. With screens, you can download an app called iNaturalist, take a picture of any plant or any animal, upload it, get some suggestions as to what it might be, and then get experts to help you identify it. And that data is then used by scientists to monitor changing environmental conditions. So a screen can literally turn a child into a scientist. I grew up, and I assume many of us grew up, in a world that was high in nature and low in technology. Today it's the reverse. Kids' lives are high in technology and low in nature. What I'm arguing is that we need to bring the screen time and the green time back into balance. As author Richard Louvre likes to say, the more high-tech our lives become, the more nature we need. So in the end, this is it. This is what we're looking for right here. We want kids to spend abundant time having fun in nearby nature. So I implore you, give kids the gift of nature. Get outside, take them there, and let them connect deeply. It is one of the greatest gifts you can ever give them, and I promise you, you will have a lot of fun along the way. Thank you very, very much.